Hello, and welcome to my LDTK walkthrough. Uh, my name is Donald. Uh, this here is my game Comet. It's built for this little guy here called the Playdate. And we are building this right now using the tool, the Wood Design Toolkit or LDTK. I was really, really happy when I heard that there was an LDTK importer for the Playdate SDK. And I'm, I'm really enjoying using it. Um, some people on the Playdate community have asked some questions about how I use it. And so I thought I would record maybe a more formal sort of walkthrough on some of the features of the application. I know that when I got into LDTK, there wasn't a lot of great resources for how people were using it or how to set it up. So maybe this will be that for some people. Um, like I said, I'm building a game called Comet. Uh, this is our itch page here. There'll be a link for it in the description. Just really proud of the way this looks and really proud of the work that me and the rest of the team here have been doing. So uh, be sure to check that out and I'll talk about it a little bit more at the end. Cool. So this is the world of Comet here as we see it at the moment. And I'm just going to kind of talk through all of the major features of the application up the top here. So let's start with tile sets. This is where you would load in different uh, tiles for your game. Uh, we've got a few here. As with everything else in LDTK, I really recommend people tag their tiles. Tags are really helpful for just, just sorting things out. So you see here that I've got tiles that are tile sets here that are for the levels themselves. I've got some tiles here that are for uh, enums. And there's some tiles here that are kind of just used for icons and UI across the game. And I'll talk about these in a little second. Um, first off, you'll notice these colours here. Uh, these colours signify kind of what the game should be doing against these tiles. So we've got one up here called Solid. So we're saying that, you know, all of these walls, or maybe let's say that these fence posts, right? These are all solid tiles. Uh, but you'll see here that we also have wood, grass, sand, and path. These are to signify different sound effects that are played when you stand on these tiles. So you stand on the dock, you'll get the wood. Uh, stand on the grass, you get, you know, a different sound effect. And so those are really some cool features here. I'll talk about how you set those up soon. Um, another little handy trick here when you're kind of naming your levels, if you put a underscore at the beginning, you it makes it easier to sort them. You see the most important things at the top, which for me is these, um, these level tiles, if I'm editing them. Icons for your uh, enums and other things like that, you'll see them throughout the rest of the video. But it's kind of a, a really handy thing to do in terms of just making the UI more useful. So I'll talk about these a bit more when we see them. But the same is true for over here, right? Down the bottom, if I could look here in the map, you know, this box here, it looks like a box because I set, took the time to load up a set of icons that have my objects in them so that I can assign it to the object. And this kind of goes a long way. All the tiles in my game Comet are 10 by 10 and so this tile set here is set 10 by 10 but sometimes we have tiles that are a bit taller. So this one here is actually, a, you know, it's also just a, a 10 by 20 tile. And so if we go out of here and come over to here where yeah, there's an example of one. So if you look at this here it looks normal, it looks as it should in game but actually when you look at it in the tile set it's offset to the left and that's just because of the way, funky ways that uh, LDTK displays some things or the limited options in terms of displaying so I'll explain that as well but you'll see here that I set it as a 20 by 20 tile even though the internals of it are 10 by 20 although my game is 10 by 10 you can actually load up any size of icon you want and so this here is a list of set of icons that are high res uh, that are 64 by 64 and these are just from a, a resource pack that I found on itch which I really liked I really wanted some nice looking icons so that when we are editing this game it's nice to look at and it's really easy to understand what's going on the reason I love LDTK so much is that it's an easy to use program it's really nice to look at I, I looked at some other alternatives like tile and other things like that and they certainly seemed like real functional pieces of software but this is like seems very nice to use and so certainly because or increasingly because playdate games are one bit only black and white it's really nice to get some colors in here and some icons so right away here even if you didn't know what the talk box was talk spot talk box was you could just kind of see this icon and maybe get an idea of what it is you know this is an npc and you can already see there's a little head here to represent the person 
Or then we've got these entities that have this little ABX icon, which kind of just gives you an idea of what this is doing. And so I think it's really important to make the editor and your settings within it really visually simple to understand. And so I've tried to put a lot of work into making all these different entities and, and tile sets and things that look nice. So that's the tile sets area. Okay, enums or enumerations. So these are kind of special values that are used by entities and a few other places. So right away here under my level data area you'll see the different values that I set for the enums for tile data. And you can colour these and you'll see that the colour that I chose here roughly represents the sort of surface that you're standing on. And those colours also came through into the tile set. Uh, there's a bunch of places where you can define the color colors within LDTK and I think it's really helpful to do it because different pieces of the software will read that and so uh, if we look here we show the enum tags we can kind of already see the colors of the different surfaces that we've got because that's been brought through. Another thing is under our enums here we set colors for the music that are in different levels and you actually see those colours now represented. Interiors are light blue, outsides for the village are light blue. When we get to nighttime, we go to this darker blue, and then when we get to the woods over here, it's green. So these colours that are defined in your enums for the music here, right, they start to kind of propagate throughout the application. So I think it's nice to be thoughtful about those sorts of things. Enums, icons. Yeah, so I talked about icons already. You know, even right this simple one here, look, I chose up left and up right. So that when you're looking at the stairs here, and you're selecting a direction, you kind of get a little icon that helps you understand what you're choosing as well. Or if we choose this NPC, right? Up, down, left, and right. So these are kind of settings that can be applied to different entities that we've defined. All of these emojis, right? Every single one of them have got a big list. And so when you're looking through a big list of emojis to apply to a character, it's nice to be able to actually see the actual image you're going to be selecting. Sprites, we have a system where we actually can preload a bunch of sprites in and select them for our NPCs. So certainly if we have a bunch of generic sprites uh, in your game, you can select them as uh, we've done it here. Uh, a few different things here, directions. So that's what enums are. It's kind of an area I don't think about a lot in LDTK, but increasingly it has some cool implications. So it's important to to use them. Uh, entities. Once again we've talked about entity icons so when you create a new entity by default it'll just have visual editor, color and a shape. I found in LDTK's importer for Playdate, a Playdate projects actually don't like you to use this integrated LDTK tile set and even kind of selecting it sometimes can screw up your file and so that's why I, I, I loaded up my own one. And so once you select your own one here, so LDTK icons, you can select, click on this and, and select which icons you want. Take note of these guys down the bottom here. What's next? Entity tags. I talked about tags already. Tags are really helpful for just sorting out your areas. Level count. Yeah, so at the bottom here of an entity is this max count area and this is kind of to define how many of a particular object can exist in a level and so a really good example of this is we have our player character and we say that there can only be one of these in the entire world not layer or level and when we add a new one the older one is discarded so the settings here to allow for that sort of stuff some of our setting some of our objects we don't have icons for like the exit and so here again you can kind of define shape uh, and even a player actually, right? Players just uh, an ellipse. Uh, but you can kind of define how you want it to look based on the edge highlights. So if we get rid of that completely, you'll notice that there's no longer an edge highlight on this here. Make it hollow, gets rid of that inside color. Uh, and then you've got your fill percentage. So I chose 40%. I thought that looked pretty good. So you can kind of see the content underneath it. What's next? Value types. Yeah, cool. So within an entity, you'll see there are these values, single value and array values. These are logical areas, uh, data settings that are used by your game engine to, to do things. For the most part in our game we've only been using a single value, but if we pull up this little debug animal here, we've actually got an array of pathing. And what this looks like, if we 
travel over to another scene. Let's go into this one here. We could actually select our animal, debug bunny, place it into the game, and then we see here that there's a pathing kind of box here. So once we select it, we can then place points in the level, and you can understand how your game might interpret that to path where your entity will travel. Uh, so you can think of it for enemy pathing or other things like that. That's a really handy one. Display and editor. Yeah, so there are entities that we've got in our game. This one way hole is one where you, by default, it's kind of got this net icon, but we are playing around with the idea of having different icons or different kind of visual looks for this object depending on where you are in the game. And so within our entity for the one way hole, display and editor, replace entity tile. So on its own, you don't actually realise potentially what this is doing, but it makes sense if you think about it. We are by default we've got this icon that has been determined, but if you change this to one way hole, it'll change what it looks like here. So again, imagine placing an enemy in the game or a chest and the different colours of that chest, or an enemy that's selected will actually be visually shown in the editor. So that's where you kind of define that setting. So. Uh, I made a bunch of entities for triggering different parts of the game. So you'll see over in my levels over here, there are these stairs. And so if we select the stair entity here, when you stand on that, it does a particular thing. So uh, we use them for kind of mini cutscenes sometimes. So there's an area in the level here where we don't want the player to pass through. We need to find a cutscene that's in our code. So we'll play this text and play this cutscene. And then we determine whether or not that's a repeatable event or just a one time thing. That's kind of a cool way to use the editor to, to place that logic. Um, but what I kind of spent a little bit of time on was actually making these boxes that looked good when you drag them. And so within our entities here, uh, you'll see I selected these different boxes I placed in and then selected nine slice scaling. There, the settings on these took a long time for me to really finagle. And if you are using a version of LDTK that doesn't have problems using the integrated tile sets, you'll find similar settings, similar looking sort of entities like these, which is great. I just had to recreate them for my game. But, you know, the result, uh, these boxes, they always kind of look good. You kind of get a colorful edge, but you can still see what's inside them. So uh, I think those are really handy for visual representations of things within your editor. Now, another really fun thing I thought was really handy for us was placing down uh, an entity that represents what the player can see in game. So let's go to the scene over here. So you can picture the player loads in and this is everything their screen can see. And so it means that I can kind of place the camera at the edge of this island and know that the player will never be able to see outside the very far edge. And so when I place my animated sprite in the background here, I don't actually have to extend it anywhere past what the player can see. And the same is true for these extra little lamp light areas I've done. And so these represent, in our game, if I kind of pull the playdate up here, the different shapes of the lamps that the character can define and place. And so I wanted there to be a fun way for, you know, to see that in game, to help understand logic for puzzles and designing encounters. So there's stuff like that that you can place in, which aren't, you know, this doesn't actually do anything in the logic of the game, but it's just a really nice feature within the editor to make things work, to make things make sense. Oh, automatic linking entities. This is a fun one. So. Uh, you have a situation where you might have a button, and that button needs to have a target. What is it actually going to be referencing in terms of what is it opening or closing? And you can actually make it within the settings that when you place object A, next time the object you place is object B, it will automatically link them together. And so, you know, if we didn't do it in that order, if I place this one down here and then I place this one here, I could click on this and target it, right? Or I could click on it 
and target this other one. So now, here, right now we have a situation where this button will turn this one up and down, whereas this button here will do both of them. So if we go into the entity settings down here and click on the button, there's this auto chain setting. And we've also, you see here, we've actually limited the references of the entities the allowed references for entity can be targeted, so we're only targeting the wall. Earlier on, I actually talked about the icon for this being 20 by 10, or 10 by 20. Uh, just based on the settings here for stretching, repeating, I found that this was the kind of the right setting to, to make that work in my game. So there we go, that's that. Uh, let's go on to layers. Uh, these are all the layers that we have in our game at the moment. And just a kind of a couple of things to talk about here is there's a setting how much you see of this layer when it's selected and when it's not selected and so for a good long time we didn't know the setting existed and so let's say we said but it defaulted to 100 you'd had a situation where if you weren't on the dark layer you would always see the dark layer so it wasn't until we actually realized that actually this is a layer we don't want to see at all oh we'll see we do want to see that layer but this dark layer, we don't want to see it at all if you're not selected it. So now, if you step away from the dark layer, you don't see it, but you step into the dark layer, you do see it. This could be handy for potentially seeing foreground tiles, right? So we could actually say that we can make these foreground tiles 69%. And so now, when I am on this layer, here we can see that uh, this foreground layer is not 100% visible. Right, it's kind of it's got some translucency to it because of the fact we defined it to be 69% when not active. So those are kind of some things to think about, really handy. Um, and again, this is a place where I've decided to use color to visually identify what each groups of layers are doing. And so all of our indoor layers, they sit at the bottom here, but there's one indoor layer above it because it's in the foreground. And so, you know, I hate to separate it logically here, but it's still connected via the colour. And again, uh, you can kind of see how these things all make sense when you're just, just looking at them, you understand. Uh, editor. So, uh, the editor's really good. The editor does, it's not perfect, there are some problems in the editor. Primarily on laptops, trackpads and that sort of stuff, it's not very easy to use, it just doesn't really support them well. I think. It makes a lot of sense for you guys to understand how to, to pick and choose items to place in here. But a couple of cool things, right? So you can potentially have an item, uh, and let's go inside actually as an example for this. We figured out in our game that although our tiles are 10 by 10, uh, our characters are a little wider, right? So if we go back to our character here, Stella, she's a bit uh, bigger than a door frame, uh, or a bit bigger than a tile, and so we wanted to make sure our door frames uh, were slightly, slightly bigger than the character was. And so we created this, right, where if we look at just the, these tiles on the left, it doesn't take up a full 10 by 10, uh, it's like 8, uh, but we always use them together, I'm always going to place these together. And so you can actually select an object uh, to always be placed together, right? No matter where I select on this, it's always going to select the full thing together. And that's because when you select something, if you hit Shift S, you'll see that on the bottom here, Saved Selection. So now I can select these two individual ones down here or select that full one together. So that's kind of a really handy tip for like, I'm only ever going to put this chest of drawers in as a full chest of drawers. Um, this isn't being placed because it's going in the background. Um, but that's kind of this beard, right? This beard comes in three parts. You've got the middle of the beard, you've got the side of the beard, and you've got the other side of the beard. And you want to do that because we're going to place two middles. Now it's a double beard. And so that's a really handy thing to know. Also, one of the things the editor has changed a few times uh, if you hit R, it changes between random mode and stamp mode. And that is sometimes seen in here, but I forget where. There we go, this one here. Enable random mode with current selection of layers. And so I can place down my, you know, my grass like this, or if I've got random mode on, 
you know, it'll randomly place that grass down. And so that's a really handy thing to have. And so you'll notice, I think you'll notice if I select here, it actually only selects this grass. But sometimes I actually want to have the flowers in too, right? So it's a little subtle thing, most people won't notice it, but uh, in Comet I actually try... Uh, you don't, These parts here are hidden under the fence posts, but the area where people live, I have more flowers. And these areas up here where people don't live, I actually have less flowers. So that's just like a subtle thing I tried to do to kind of... And certainly as we get into the woods over here. Right, there's no flowers around. And so, you know, I'm selecting different parts of these tiles to be placed randomly. I have got these tiles over here for paths, but I actually use auto rules, auto layers for these. Auto layers are really powerful, it's one of the kind of the big features for LDTK. Uh, and it allows you to do cool things. So I can place down a bunch of trees. And that automatically makes sense, right? This here is a particularly complicated uh, auto tile setup that somebody in the Playdate community named Nick uh, helped me with. I, I really was struggling with it. Cool. So you can see how it becomes quite simple to make something that looks really good, right? You before this, I was painstakingly placing down a bunch of these tiles and making sure I got the right corners for different parts, but now it's something I don't need to worry about. Um, and so I really encourage you guys to get into auto tiles. You could potentially do a whole video like this just for auto tiles, but thankfully a wee while ago they made auto tiles a little bit easier where they created uh, kind of an auto layer rules assistant that lets you define some particular tiles and it'll kind of figure out logically the rules that go around them. And you might even use that as a starting point and then switch to this advanced mode to say, okay, now I can see how it chose the rules for this. I encourage you to have a play with that. It's really valuable. And I guess the last thing I want to say is that around the rules, our particular level design toolkit LDTK implementation for the Playdate doesn't support flipping. So you can actually say, you can define a rule to say, oh, the tile for this corner is actually the same as this corner, right? This corner is the same as this corner, but just flipped. And so, you, potentially, if your importer is smart enough, you can actually say, mirror this on the X and Y, and it will understand where to put it in those opposite corners. But hopefully that was kind of a good overview of just some LDTK features that can help you. Oh, actually, a couple more quick things to remind you guys about. We have some project settings if we can hear it through here. Uh, some particular fun ones to talk about here is exporting your entire level as a PNG or different layers as PNGs. This could allow you to maybe piece your game together in different ways or what I'd maybe hoped to do at one point was to uh, create time lapses of levels based on every time you make a change or to save that. Um, but whenever you have a setting turned on it actually yeah, makes saving your game or saving the editor a lot more longer. It kind of wasn't worth it. Uh, backup on save, you can define a custom destination to save backups for your level uh, or your project files and define how many of those you want, that's really helpful. I think we save it outside of our git because git itself is already a backup sort of solution and so we are just saving it on different people's computers themselves. And then custom commands, custom commands are really cool, I've not had a chance to figure them out just yet, but what ideal would be for us is that every time you save the game you run a command that actually builds your game. So you can save it in the editor and straight away jump into the simulator and just refresh and play. That'd be really cool. Okay, this really is the end for me now. Um, thank you all for coming and checking it out. Uh, this is again our game Comet. We think it's pretty nifty, has some big hangout energy. And so I really encourage you guys to follow us on Itch. And if you want, follow me on Twitter or Mastodon or Blue Sky, uh, where I post different updates and GIFs of the game and development. Thanks very much.